Okay, everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. For those who don't know, my name is Amanda Carling. I am the manager of Indigenous Initiatives here at the Faculty of Law, and I am so excited to welcome a full room of folks to the first Indigenous Initiatives Office Speaker of the Year, the first of 2020. Yes, that's worthy of a whoop whoop. Um, I am calling this the year of hopefully see, seeing clearly 2020. So, amongst other things, we hope that our neighbors to the south see clearly in their election that is coming up. Um, maybe we hope that the government starts to see clearly in the labor negotiations that are ongoing with the teachers. Uh, we hope that there are lots of opportunities for folks to see clearly in 2020. Um, I wanted to, of course, acknowledge that the University of Toronto and specifically the Faculty of Law operate on land that is not ours. Um, it is land that has been long shared and cared for by different groups of Indigenous people, First Nations people, including the Huron Wenda, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and I am sure very many others uh, that we're not acknowledging. But I'm, if you can't tell from my Manitoba accent, um, I'm Métis from Manitoba and I'm a guest here and while I've been here for a decade, I think that it's really important to acknowledge um, how grateful I am to get to be here and get to invite amazing people uh, like Darcy here to speak with us. Before I introduce Darcy, I wanted to uh, just promote two events that are upcoming which you may already know about, in which case continue to enjoy your food and tune me out until Darcy starts uh, speaking, but the first is um, a joint event with the Indigenous Law Students Association. Uh, we are welcoming IU Peters here on Friday, February the 7th um, to do a film screening of Angry Enoch. It's a documentary which you may or may not have seen already, but if you have, it, if you have seen it or if you haven't seen it, um, you should come and be part of that. Uh, Ayu is an amazing advocate. She is an Enoch lawyer. She is a seal skin clothing designer. She is um, an incredibly engaging speaker and teacher, and we are very excited that she's joining us here at the Faculty of Law. Um, we are also excited to be welcoming Professor Nancy Sandy, who right now is teaching at Lakehead, and she's going to talk about some of her, and I'm not going to pronounce it properly, and I'm going to apologize, but I'm going to try, and I'm going to exercise humility in my attempt, in my attempt to pronounce um, her community as Sequatmik. Yeah. Yeah, how think. would you say it? <laughs> but I'm probably wrong as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to teaching us how to pronounce her community, she will also um, be talking a lot about um, her community's laws as well as the seven sacred teachings or you might know them as the grandfather teachings because she's doing work with the law students up at Lakehead on those. Um, so I hope that's Monday the March the 9th and now I'm going to turn to our guest of honor. Um, our guest of honor is Darcy Lindbergh and he joined the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta just last year as an assistant professor. His current doctoral research focus focuses on the constitution and legal theory of the Plains Cree people in relation to the land, water, and animals, and the trans-systemic relationships with the Canadian constitutional law. Um, Darcy earned his LLM at the University of Victoria, where his thesis explored Cree legal orders through an examination of ceremonial rules of procedure and the transformation of gendered protocols. He has published and has publications forthcoming regarding Indigenous laws and legal theory, Plains Cree Constitutionalism and Food Sovereignty and Indigenous Citizenship Orders. Darcy is mixed roots Plains Cree and he was called to the bar in Yukon and British Columbia in 2012. He practiced with Davis LLP in the Yukon Territory and he's been involved with the Indigenous Focused, focused Youth Leadership Development in Alberta for the last 15 years. Um, he came all the way from Alberta, Treaty 6, to join us. Um, I wish that we had warmer weather to offer him at the this very least. This is so warm. And unlike many of our guests, typically at the end of the talk, I would thank the guest and give them a gift and say goodbye to them. Um, I am engaging Darcy in his visit wholeheartedly. This is one of many things that we've asked him to do while he's visiting with us. Um, so thank you so much for coming yeah. here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thanks for thanks for having me. Is this mic working? I just want to check and okay. I'm a soft speaker, so I know that. So I just want to make sure everything's going good. Um, it is. It was freezing in Edmonton last week. It was at one point minus 44. That felt like uh, on a walk. So this is 
uh, t-shirt weather. I'm actually wearing flip-floppy shoes. So I'm like, yes, <laughs> take the boots off. You can just walk around. Um, I'm grateful for this introduction. Um, grateful that y'all came here. We have a packed house. Um, I see friends um, from academia, friends from uh, youth work in Alberta, um, from our territory. Um, my One of my supervisors is here from my PhD and this is if I've passed this exam here, then <laughs> I'm on my way. So no, I'm grateful to see um, uh, academic uh, friends here as well. Uh, so I am um, going to talk today. I kind of have taken a bit of a liberty. Um, I, as as Matt had mentioned, I'm teaching at the University of Alberta in the law faculty. Um, but I really want to think about this idea of 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 legal ethics as a legal practitioner from a Plains Cree perspective. So. Um, I appreciated the uh, the invitation here, and I asked Amanda, like, what do you want me to talk about? Um, what can I, and she said, well, gave me some very broad parameters, and so this is something I want to talk about. I'm going to walk through it today. Um, I got a nice PowerPoint here that is mostly just to keep me on track, um, but here's a summary of what I want us to think about here. Um, first, I'm going to talk about this idea of Wetaskiwin and, and, and neighborliness and how that actually is a legal principle for for us. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I'm mixed-rooted Plains Cree. Um, my mother is Plains Cree, my dad is Swedish Canadian and Métis and Cree. Um, in a family. So we kind of grew up, and I know this is not the word we use these days, but we understood our relations from, um, in our Cree, Cree family, we have our Wagotoin relations, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but we understood where we kind of like resided in this as well. And so we understood ourselves as half-breeds growing up, which is, I know it's not a term we use today, um, but is something we continue to just to, to situate ourselves. But we also understood that we're also part of this greater Plains Cree family, and then also a confederacy that we can talk about as well. Um, so with Tasquin, um, it, it has this, this meaning within, within Plains Cree about neighborliness, but it also extends to our treaty relationships. So that's kind of what I want to get on. And then I'll start, we'll talk about legal theory in a very non theoretical, academic theoretical way, but from a Plains Cree perspective or my family's perspective at least. And then how this relates to ethics and practicing law. And then finally, um, you can tell I'm, I'm in full academic teaching mode. I'm like, and then how are we applying this? I want us to look at the, um, the situation that's actually going in the far west here with the Wet'suwet'en territory. Um, and um, we have a hereditary clan there, Unistoten, that is, is, um, is, is resisting this, this natural gas uh, pipeline that's going there. That's creating a lot of challenges for the Wet'suwet'en peoples, but is also creating challenges for Canadian law and how it takes up Indigenous law as well. And so I want to think about how we, if we're thinking about different ways of practicing as a lawyer, how does this affect how we approach these kind of situations as well? So that's my summary. How did I do, Heidi? I'm good? Okay. <laughs> um, so with Tasquin, uh, we, we talk about this as Plains Cree treaty making. Uh, it's the idea that we're, with Tasquin, it, it actually translates into living on the land together. Um, and it's long been a, a legal concept for uh, Plains Cree peoples. It's also an individual concept. It, it informs our relationships as individuals, as families that live together. And it's also been applied to our sort of nationhood and how we relate to other nations as well. Um, so our, we, as part of this, and I'll, I'll kind of share some stories of Wetaskiwin here, but the idea is that it's not just a legal relationship that is fixed, um, but it requires a sort of renewal in, I guess, our legal processes and a way that we share our lives together. Um, so another way that we interpret Wetaskiwin is, is um, uh, uh, we call it like living in peace is one way that we talk about it as well. And then another way um, in a sort of modern concept, and this is Dr. Wilton Littlechild, who's from uh, the Musquechis area. He actually talks about this as reconciliation. He says, Wetaskiwin is, is, is the Plains Cree word for reconciliation, because it means this is how we're gonna live on the land together, and it gives us actual pragmatic ways of, of, of being two nations beside each other, or many nations as well. And so out of all of this is with Haskin, it's a living thing, it's a living concept that we have within our communities. So I know this is, this is like, it's, you're just like, what's this picture? It's just at the prairies. Um, actually, where I grew, I grew up in Wetaskiwin, Alberta. Um, 
which is a city in, in Alberta that takes its name from an event I'm going to describe here. And we have this place, it's, it's called the Peace Hills. It's just outside of the city. And this is from atop it. And it's actually a place where you could see um, on the prairies because it's fairly flat there and in quite a distance. So I know it's hard to make out, but you see there's like a dark band at the top on the horizon. That's uh, Musquachee. So that's actually where, um, formerly known as Hobima, um, the four nations of uh, um, Korean Central Alberta reside to. So this hill is actually really prominent for a lot of reasons. And one is you could see the other hills in the area. So you could see where, where this is. Um, so we, we, can, we can source this idea of Wetaskiwin as a legal principle in another way. We have our stories, we have language, we have ceremonies, and then we have the land itself. And so I'm going to just kind of walk through these. Again, this is more for me to keep me on track here. Um, but the story of Wetaskiwin um, goes like this. And I know somebody, some people in this room have heard me tell this before. So hopefully I'll try to add a new little twist here into it as well. Uh, but with Tasquin, uh, where the, the place where I grew up in central Alberta, how it actually gets its name there, it's actually, uh, with Tasquin is a bit of a uh, corruption of the Cree word. Um, it actually is, it's called with Tasquinik, which means like living on the land together in, in this, this place. And then with Tasquin, that makes it a, a, na uh, a noun or a thing which means like it's a, a, a legal principle. So with Tasquin Nick um, is a place on the land. And what happened, we have this old story that's been shared through our families about it, is back in the day there was um, when Buffalo, which was a, uh, a really significant relations for a lot of indigenous nations on the prairie. So for uh, Plains Cree peoples, for Nitsitapi peoples, the Blackfoot peoples to the south, um, Stony, uh, Tsitina, uh, we, there's, Buffalo was not only a, provided nourishment for us, but it also centered a lot of our sort of ceremonial, legal, and economic lives. Um, so as Buffalo started becoming less, uh, less so on the prairies, the destruction of these, these, these populations, what we found is that Plains Creek people and Blackfoot people, we started to come into, come into contact in the same hunting grounds quite a bit. And, and so there actually was a lot of conflict at this time, um, physical conflict between Plains Cree peoples and Blackfoot peoples. Um, so what happened at Wetaskiwin, um, because the two communities, um, so they're, they're, they're different um, family groups, different what we, people would call bands, um, were really close to each other near Wetaskiwin. And so each sent a young chief uh, to go see where the other people were. So the Cree sent a young, a young chief and the Blackfoot did the same, they sent a young chief. And they sent them to the same hill, they sent them to this hill here um, in Wetaskiwin. And as the, our oral tradition tells us, that they come upon this hill at the same time. So they get to the top and what they do is they see each other and they know that this person is their Cree and Blackfoot. And because there had been this, this, this relative um, short history of physical conflict between each other, they knew they'd actually have to fight. But our stories tell, and there's a lot of lessons in this, is they actually chose to fight without weapons, so they put down their weapons. And then they engaged each other in this top of this hill and they fought. And so I've heard, when I first heard this story, it was just kind of like, it was just kind of told to me. And then I heard it through one of our older ones, one of our elders. And he said that they actually fought for like four hours straight. Um, trying to get the better of each other. And what they found is they couldn't, they, neither the Blackfoot person or the Cree person could overcome the other. And what happened was, so they decided to take a break. So they sat down on this hill and the Blackfoot person pulled out his pipe. So this is, this is uh, a common thing that people carried back in the day. Um, he had his personal pipe and he was smoking it just as, as a break. And the Cree person uh, went to do the same but found that their pipe had broken in this fight, in this four hour fight. And so the Blackfoot person just re reflexively offered him, uh, the Cree person, this pipe and they smoked it and, um, and they shared that as well. So once they did that, uh, they realized they actually had shared um, a legal process together. They had shared tobacco together um, in this way that they both understood from their legal traditions and their nations that this meant they actually put an, an end to their own like individual conflict with each other. And so they both understood that as like as as two people within their own sort of like uh, history, traditions and, and law, what they did there and they understood to respect the other people's law as well. And so they did, they stopped fighting there. And then they went back to their communities and they talked about it with their old ones. So they deliberated on it. 
um, and there are old ones for each the Blackfoot community and the Cree community. They said, yes, this, the, we actually think this was a good thing. And you, you had some sort of treaty event there. And then, so then they returned as communities both to the top of this hill and they made a formal treaty together. Um, so that's why it's called Wetaskiwin. It's known as the place where uh, peace was made, um, the Hills of Peace in, in Alberta, we call this. So um, we have this company, it's called Peace Hills Trust. It actually grows out, that, that name grows out of um, this event in, in Wetaskiwin there. So that is just one story. That's one story of treaty, of, of neighborliness um, that we have as Plains Cree peoples. Um, we have many other stories that are along this line as well. So just down the road from Wetaskiwin, we have uh, what I kind of shared with you, um, our old ones, they'd say that is a chaos achimuina. Um, and they, what they'd mean by that is that was a long time ago story. Um, so it was something that people can remember that we have lineage, so people actually remember who that young chief was, and people are related to them through their lineage. Um, but it's a story that's long enough, it, it's long ago. Um, and we also have our Atayakwina, and these are our sacred stories. So these are like our origin stories. Um, so we also have a mixing of these stories when we talk about Wetaskiwin um, with the Blackfoot as well. So we have a neighboring story um, just down the road on the prairies. Uh, we have this place, it's called the Neutral Hills. And in this story, it was the same sort of conflict between the Blackfoot and the Cree. And um, they talk about as our, our, our creator, Kichimanatu in our language, um, which is like the kind spirit, um, is, is how we um, translate that, uh, sees this fighting and sees this hardship between the new nations. And so overnight, in the middle of the night, grows these hills in between them both. And so again, just like in the first story, it takes an interpretation of that. It's not just like, oh, this happened and now we're, peaceable people, they thought about, bo both nations thought about what this meant, and they thought, yes, like this is, the, the creator is, is taking pity on us, is being humble for us, and so we're going to create a treaty there as well, and, and so we have an older story where they did as well, um, at the Neutral Hills. So we have all these narratives of, of treaty, of neighborliness, that we still rely upon today to give us legal principles or law. Um, so there's some work that we need to do to get there, um, to, to act out these laws, but um, that is one of the gifts and the wealth of our nation, I would say, or, or my family, to speak specifically, um, that we have these laws that are encoded in this way that we can hear them um, forever. So I was told these stories of Wetaskiwin when I was really young, and then when you're young, you're just like, you're just a kid and you're, you're having fun and you like the, the fantastical elements of them, like, the fighting was great. You're like, oh yeah, they're wrestling. That's awesome. Um, and then you grow up and you start to think about him. You start to think about like, what is this teaching me? Um, how is this teaching me to be a good person to, um, to my neighbors? How's it been teaching me to be a good person to other nations as well? So this idea of ethics, it's, you start to see it once you start to look at stories in, in this way as well. Um, it's also in our language. So Wetaskiwin, I, I mentioned, um, means we have these definitions for it. The, the etymology of this is, is Ewan kind of makes it a place or a thing or a noun. Um, Aski, you see it kind of in the middle of the word, is, is our word for land. Um, and Wetaskiwin is kind of like we are, we is like we're, it's kind of a, a prefix that describes aiding or assisting. So we have other words like Wichitawin, um, which means like we're, we're aiding people. And so it's this idea of like, this is the land where we're gonna aid each other and, and help each other. So I am, I am, I like, when our elders ask me if I know the language, I know enough to know that word in Cree, the, the sentence, and then I usually say, Namoya, which means no, or Ipsis, and then I go like this, like a little bit. I'm, I'm a very small language learner because of a lot of our histories, my family kind of like lost its use of language and we're returning to that as well. And then we have ceremonies. So we have our pipe ceremony that was really um, integral in that relationship uh, there. Um, so some of you I know in the room will understand once I tell that story and I mention pipe, you're like, oh yes, like I understand the legal relationships that is occurring here as well. Because our, our pipe ceremonies, um, um, especially on the prairies, the pipe is used by many nations in, in their own ways. Um, but we also have this kind of common understanding of what that means. So we have protocols that are different and we have different teachings that come out of it um, that are really important. So it's really important not to pan-indigenize the use of pipes. Um, but there also is an acknowledgement that there is some sort of sharing of some traditions there as well. Um, so, 
So as it said, that ceremony, that pipe ceremony that they engaged in, what they did is they were bringing down, um, they're bringing um, you know, the creator into these relationships and also bringing the land. So in our pipes, they're made of, we have our pipe stem, which is made of wood. And then we have our bowls, which is stone. And we have a lot of teachings and stories that link back to how and we're actually having, um, using a pipe as a, a, I don't know, a legal process, if I can use that term as well. Uh, that you're bringing in the earth as well. So you're bringing in lands and waters into those ceremonies as well. So if you think about Treaty 6, um, when we signed Treaty 6, uh, we have the document in the text, which is, it's not, it's two pages. Um, but then we have this whole other side of the treaty that is informed by our legal processes. And so our old ones, our elders, they always talk about how the pipe has brought in all of these laws. It's brought the land as a, um, Heidi's reading my dissertation right now, so I'm just using the language out of it. It's made the land an agent in this treaty. Um, so you get a check mark there for that. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it's truly in that language, um, our elders, they say it in different ways, but that's what they mean. The, the, the land has been animated in our treaty relationships through our pipe ceremonies. And then we have um, the land itself. So Nehiel Aski, that's kind of like Cree land, Cree territory. Um, and as I mentioned, we have this story of Wetaskiwin. We have the site, and then we have the neutral hills. We have all these other sort of stories as well that really set out laws you can learn if you go to the land and you remember those stories as well. So the land, um, back in the day, it, it was like a mnemonic device. You would go to it and you can recall stories. Um, and it still sort of works that way as well. It has these stories encoded in that and, and we continue to practice. So I remember when I was eight years old and my older brother, um, were dri I can remember distinctly, we're driving in a car after Christmas and him telling me one another story that I'm not gonna share here. And the reason he was telling me because we're actually driving by the general area where you could see it, you know, and we kind of get into this conversation as well. Um, so the land, it provides this idea of law um, for us as well. I'm so like ingrained in teaching right now that after every slide, I'm like, any questions? I want to <laughs> say it, I'm like, you can't ask questions, not to the end. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about ceremony as an avenue towards law before we get back into like the ethics part of this. Um, we have this story. Uh, it's actually shared by our Anishinaabe relatives as well. Um, we can argue who tells it better. Uh, <laughs> probably the Anishinaabe people. But we, we, we do our best with it as well. And it's a story about the creation of our ceremonies. And we're told we're actually gifted seven ceremonies. And what occurred was there was uh, a young person and in their family, they were in their community and they found that their community was sick, um, both in the mind, in their body, and then people were just sick spiritually as well. And so this young person set out to find a cure for this. And, and according to the story, travels um, really far east and encounters um, a wolf in the east. And, and the wolf has, has seen this, this person traveling and, and asks them what they're doing. And the boy says, I'm looking for this cure um, for my community. And he says, oh, I, cannot do, I can't provide that. I'm sorry. But I, 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 uh, I acknowledge what you're doing is a good thing. And um, you should continue on with that. So gets this lesson, goes back to his community, still sees that it's sick, and then goes on this journey in the, f the three other directions. And so goes south, encounters another animal that tells the same thing, um, goes, goes west, encounters another animal that says, I've been watching your journey, and I think this is what you're doing is such a humble thing for your community. Um, but I don't have the medicine that you need and then returns and then goes north and does the same thing and encounters polar bears in the north that say the same thing. And so this, this person comes back to their community, has gone in these four directions and has not found the, this, this cure for their community. But um, what we call Kehu, uh, the eagle, has been actually watching this occur. The eagle in, in our traditions and maybe in other people's as well um, flies um, high enough that it actually has this view of the world where it can see things from a, a different vantage point that gives it a different perspective. And so this eagle sees that this boy has gone on this journey um, and, and sees him on the, as I was told in the story, the boy is, overlooks his community on this hill and the eagle lands and says, I've seen you go on this journey four times and like everybody else, I acknowledge this is such a good thing that you're doing. 
I cannot offer you the medicine that you want, but I can take you to a place where people can help you. And so the boy agrees. And so according to that story, the eagle takes the boy and flies to the dark side of the moon. And so it's taken up and, and, and is the dark side of the moon. And then when it, they're on the dark side of the moon, um, seven grandmothers and, and grandfathers, or kukums and mushums, uh, visit the boy there. And what they do is they provide these gifts of ceremony. And so then they, um, uh, so I mentioned the pipe ceremony is one of those gifts that was provided um, according to that story to our peoples um, for the health of our nations. And so we have other ceremonies. We have like our sweat lodge ceremonies, our thirst dances. Um, we have uh, our elders, they talk about um, chasing the ball, chasing a ball with a stick is an actual ceremony, an older ceremony as well that was given at this time. So we have seven of those that are given. Um, and and so then the boy returns to the community and is able to bring health to the community through what was shared there as well. And so the reminder in the sky for us is the Big Dipper. So according to how I was told the story, that these seven mushums and cookums, these seven grandmothers and grandfathers, they traveled from um, the stars of the Big Dipper to the dark side of the moon to, to give those there as well. So when we talk about land, um, so I feel like I'm John Burroughs right now when I'm saying like, where we have the sky as well to give us legal relationships. I think I'm even just using his voice at this point, um, which is true. Okay. So I, I'm gonna offer just, this is my own view of legal theory from a Plains Cree perspective. Um, and and how it relates to legal ethics is, is really important. So um, we have this word, so our, our word for law is we are so awina. Um, and the uh, etymology of this word, it's actually the, the act of weaving or braiding um, and is kind of the way it's described by people who are fluent with the language. That's one sort of characterization of it. And I like that, so I, I've included this picture of sweetgrass because um, uh, it, it, it you know, it's the way I kind of think about this as well. Um, so we have these lessons with, with braiding sweetgrass where, you know, we have one strand that's easy to break, but when you braid more together, it becomes strengthened, right? So, so what I've shared today, um, you know, is just like a few strands of like the ideas of our laws. And once you can see, once you put a lot of those together, it creates a strength of a legal order or a legal system as well. So, and in this as well, there's the, we have this, we also actually means like coming together and then Awina makes it a noun. So that's kind of the etymology of this here. Um, and then, so the way I see this, we have our stories, our ceremonies, our language, our land, we have art, we have um, deliberation, we have uh, votes and chief and council, those sorts of things. We have all these sources of law. Um, that make up our legal order. Um, but we have this tradition of a reliance on deliberation um, and persuasion rather than just strict authority with, with Plains Cree law. So the reason why these stories have carried on um, throughout history, throughout our history, is because they're persuading us that they, they have meaning in our lives today. So that's why we continue to tell these stories. Um, and, and that sets out, I guess, a personality of our legal order is like persuasion, if we can tell stories, if we can embody that, if we can make people feel good. Uh, we have Wasagi Chak stories. Um, it's snowed here. We can talk about our Wasagi Chak stories here, um, which are entertaining. Um, like they're often pretty like uh, vulgar, um, but they still, they serve a purpose to persuade um, how we are gonna, we're gonna act together as, as good peoples um, uh, in our time here. Another sort of teaching I like to talk about, I mean, it might not even have anything to do with what I just said with this, uh, with the sweetgrass, is I was taught at a, when I was in my early 20s um, by an old one, uh, they kind of laid a sweetgrass out and they said, well, here, if you look at time as a linear thing, we have, you know, we have, we have childhood at one end and we have purple roots for sweetgrass and at the other end we have um, elderdom or, you know, being an old one. And in the middle we have this, uh, this time where you grow from adolescence into adulthood. And what this person was, it was a lesson towards maybe my conduct at the time, I don't know, um, was saying like in the middle, it gets really thick, right? Life gets thick um, and, um, and we're, we're thick with all things like we have 
uh, responsibilities and pressures, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're a child, you're in this purple pure state, and at the end, <laughs> all those things sort of fall away when you get back to that purity as well. And so they talk about the, the, the relationship between elders and our youth is really important for that because it connects that circle back to this sort of purity stage as well. Um, so I share that only, to, you know, sometimes when people hear these stories, they're like, oh, that's just great entertainment as well. Um, but it's part of this sort of teaching that um, we have to return this, that, this idea of, um, of, of simple laws um, that will have profound effect as well. So the, the thinker, Plains Cree uh, legal scholar, Harold Cardinal, uh, Harold, Cardinal, Harold Johnson, um, he talks about this. He'll say, Plains Cree law, it may seem really simple, when you first engage it, but what actually it is, is there's just a complexity that you just continue to learn your whole life. And so um, our old ones, they, they'll say this, they say like, um, by the end of my life, I might have started to learn something about our laws, right? Because they understand, they see like, when you're young, you don't even know what you don't know. And then, then our old ones see this like, this, this deep collective law that we're kind of like working with. Okay, so, uh, Plains create legal ethics. So from these stories, from these sources, we can start to pull out um, the idea of, of how we are as, as people and in how are we having ethical relationships with each other. So I've just highlighted a few here. Um, these are not by all means like a, this isn't a code of Cree um, legal ethics. If you're a Cree legal practitioner, this is not like your... Uh, uh, this isn't your, your governing body and you're not going to get sanctioned, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's much more as well, but um, these are just some of the, the some foundational ones that we see within our stories, within our teachings, within our art, um, on how we walk as legal practitioners. So by the way, when I use legal practitioners, uh, returning to this idea of deliberation and persuasion, um, for, for us it's different. So I practiced as a lawyer, um, as Amanda had mentioned, for three years. And um, I was in the Yukon Territory with a firm. The last day I was there, it actually disbanded. It had been around for like 150 years. And then when I left, it, it, it merged with somebody else. So I was like, I guess I ruined their firm. I don't know <laughs> what happened there. Um, but I had, I had ethics according to the oath that I took to um, the British Columbia bar and the Yukon bar as well that I was called to. And it was codified, it was within the laws there. And um, it meant that I had a duty to uphold this, these obligations, um, often in a fiduciary manner. Um, but, um, but nobody, you know, if you're not, if you're just a resident of BC, you don't have those same sort of ethics. Well, that's not the same for, you know, Cree legal ethics. We're taught like law is practiced by everybody. We're all legal practitioners and we all have a duties towards these ethics. We all have these obligations as well. Um, so when we talk about truthfulness, um, Deb Wewin, uh, this is the idea that we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have truthful relations to each other. We're going to speak truth. We are going to um, admit like facts, those sorts of things. It actually does have very pragmatic uh, meaning to it. Um, and then we have this idea of humility. So um, our older ones, they will often say that, um, like I mentioned, like I don't know nothing, they'll say, and then they'll share you something that is just really important to you. Um, or they'll say like, if I've offended you, I do not mean so, I, I, you know, I know nothing. These are our old ones. They're setting an example for us to really walk in a, a humble way a humi a, uh, with humility. Um, so uh, again, when I mention this as well, it, it's important not to romanticize this. Like a, there are actually really pragmatic features of this, of these that occur. So it, you can't just go out and say, well, I'm, I'm being really humble here. And often when somebody says they're humble, <laughs> the first sign that they're not being humble in that moment. Um, but it's something that is just taught that we're ingraining this, this sort of humility. Um, so where it comes into really important um, is when we think about, uh, you know, practicing law in an inspirited manner. The reason why I put that in this, this title that I came up with in 10 minutes and I was like, yeah, that's, that sounds great, is when I'm returning thinking about how how are we walking in relation to the lands, waters, and animals, and other non-human agents on the earth? Um, 
the way our old ones talk about humility, it's a way to counteract the idea of superiority over other beings that we um, is often encoded through other cultures. And so this humility, it's teaching us that um, you know, we have stories where we are the, um, the most useless of, of animals on our own. We are, we're naked without other animals and things. Um, so this, this is the idea of we're, we're, we're placing ourselves um, in humility within an ecology of, of relations around us. We have this idea of Wakotan as well, and this is the law that governs our relations together. It's how we relate. So we do have this phrase that is done, said by other nations, like all my relations, and that's been carried on actually through our nation as well um, in, our, in our language. Um, but it actually has very specific uh, meaning to, to what our relationships are. So it can... Um, Go ahead. I need a no, Oh no! I sorry. I, I I was like I need to get a drink of water as well. So, um, we'll go to when it has this this idea of um, family relations. So what I told you, like my family, we always understood where we were um, with within our family structure. It's because we still practice this this way of Wagotwin, Like how do we relate to each other? So. Um, my cousins, my first cousins especially, they're essentially like my siblings um, because they could come over to our place at any time, um, at any point um, in the middle of the night, and they were accepted in there. Like they were, they're, they're brought in, they were given a bed, a home, they could stay for as long as they want. That was just the law that we had in our family, this kind of will go to in relationship. And then we had other laws, even just with our aunties and uncles, they could come and then there was a time when they'd have to um, contribute after a certain period, but we had these actually like really structured laws um, growing up. And then we have this other guy, other way of what we'll go to it's kind of like an older concept is like how do we relate to non-human beings and things as well? And how do we welcome them in as kin? Um, so we have laws there. And then I'd mentioned this idea of wichituen, uh, mia wichituen, it's the idea of good, good aid and assisting. So Wetaskoin and Wichituin, um, they go hand in hand. It's kind of the idea if you've entered into a treaty relationship or even a neighbor relationship, that you had an obligation to assist. There, there's a, there's uh, this idea of good aid um, is something that's just really inherent into our lives. So it's actually one of those laws that, so for some of you might have these within your families as well. You just think it's like, it's just being a good person, right? Um, this is how I was taught, how I was growing up. Um, and then we could start to see how this is an actual obligation uh, in, a, in a legal sense as well. How am I doing for time? What time are we going to? Ooh, okay, I can stretch this story out then. <laughs> 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 it's like 40 minutes. Uh, yeah, so we can start to see that. So that's not a conclusive list of legal ethics, according to Plains Cree peoples. Um, we have many others that are there as well. Um, but it's this idea, uh, if you're, you know, if you're going to embody um, this kind of like legal and governance um, tradition of, of Plains Creek peoples, then you can, these, these ethical responsibilities on how you carry out your life come along with it, right? So they're, they're positive obligations that are put upon you um, towards a number of areas. So, so you can start to think about if we go back to those stories, uh, we go to the story of Wetaskiwin, you can start to see, uh, well, where, where do we see uh, these, these ethics arise well you can see it like they they shared a pipe so you can might say like they entered a, a will go to win relationship there and so they actually had an obligation not to fight each other as well so so often our laws they can be criticized because they're not specific enough but when you actually start to look at the practices we have very specific protocols that guide these relations as well um, so I do want to share this story so we can think about these legal ethics um, and there will be an exam at the end. Uh, it's uh, the story of Maskpatan. And, and so Maskpatan uh, was a Cree chief um, in, from the Musquechis area, actually um, is related to a number of people from Samson and Ermanskin uh, and the nations down there. And um, Maskpatan, uh, 
was also known as a peacemaker. So the reason his story is actually well known amongst non-Indigenous people as well. And the reason it's for that is because we actually had a lot of missionaries coming into Alberta at the time. And because uh, Muscatine would go out and try to create peace, they saw him as like some sort of like, uh, like biblical, f not figure, but kind of like in the range of like, oh yeah, he's bringing peace. Because he actually did, he had, he showed a lot of, um, he, like he took the Bible up as well. And so you actually, if you see these stories written from um, a missionary perspective in Alberta, they're like, oh yeah, he was out there uh, talking about, you know, the Bible um, to indigenous people. Uh, but we have our stories about like returning to this sort of like legal ordering and the legal ethics that we have, that this is what Musquetin was doing. So he was actually really integral in creating peace with the Blackfoot peoples. That sort of Wetaskiwin event I mentioned, it, it continued in central Alberta from about 18, um, 1850 till about 1871. Um, so it actually just wasn't one event. So they didn't just make one treaty in Wetaskiwin. It was multiple events over a long period of time that actually sustained the peace uh, between them. So uh, this idea that a treaty can be made um, within seven days is only a fallacy when we think about the historical treaties in the prairies, for example. Because even modern treaties, um, like in BC, those are like 20 years in the making as well, because there's lots to deal with. So our treaty making with um, Blackfoot peoples, um, again, was this long process of continual treaty events um, that occurred. So uh, Maskwitan, um engaged in us, he was, he was fearless. He would just cross into Blackfoot territories when hostilities were really bad. Um, and, um, and he gained a lot of respect for that as well. Um, um, but what happened one time was his father was killed. He was killed by a Blackfoot person. And so they were negotiating a treaty. Um, it might have actually been the one at Wetaskiwin, but I haven't seen the ones that, that been linked, but they're negotiating another sort of uh, treaty around this time. And the person who had killed Muscatin's father was in this party of Blackfoot peoples in this band. And he knew that. So this person knew that there would be some sort of retribution that would be a part of this sort of peacemaking agreement that we're coming up with. And so sure enough, Muscatin, he called this Blackfoot person over and asked, um, you know, bring me, and he knew the name of the person. Um, and so this person thought that he would be killed because as, as retribution or justice for the death of his father. And so this person approached Muscatin and he told this person, he said, put on, put on my father's clothes and brought out his father's clothes and he put those on. And as the stories that I was told, this person began to shake because he was so scared because he thought this was some sort of like um, ceremony that was going on before justice was going to come. And, and then he said, and he painted his father's horse and he brought his father's horse out there and he said, now get up on my father's horse. And this person got even more scared and he got up there and he sat there. And then what he said next, he said, now I'm going to, because I have lost my father and it's created all this sorrow within me, I'm going to take you in as my new father. So he adopted this person who actually killed his father as his new father. So, so that story gets shared. You can see why that story gets shared by like even like, like Christian missionaries, because they see us like, oh, it's like these, in a very racist way of like, these nations that are just warring together and they look at this, this act of peace that forms a bond. Um, but when you actually look at our stories, this is, this is a continuation of a history of, of treaty making between um, Plains Creek people and Blackfeet people in this event. So that was an adoption. Um, so what Muscatin was doing, he's adopting somebody into our community in order to create a familial bond. So when we look at legal ethics and we think about we'll go to win, um, what Musquitin is doing there is creating a, a relationship with a person um, in order to create, uh, in order to stop the harm between our communities, but to create um, goodwill and peacemaking. So um, not only like a very valorous act, uh, uh, you can't deny that as well, but it's also according to a legal tradition of treaty making that we had. And so we actually have other stories that continue on that line. We have um, our famous chiefs Crow, Crowfoot, who's a Blackfoot chief and Poundmaker. Um, Crowfoot actually adopted Poundmaker in the same sort of way. Um, we have other chiefs, other stories where um, in our way that we talk about it as uh, counting coup, where 
um, young people would drop their weapons and try to go walk into, often it involves stealing horses, but we actually have this other story where it's like, they leave their weapons and they just walk into this Blackfoot chief's house. And, uh, and they catch him naked there as part of the story. And, and, the, and the Blackfoot chief, um, who had lost his son actually to a battle with the Cree, said, these people, they have, um, they have struck away my sorrow by the way they've walked in there. And then they, he adopts them as his new sons as well. So we have this whole tradition of, of our older ones, especially seeing that, oh, we have hostilities. So what we need to do actually is become related to each other. We have to um, take people in as well. So those are um, huge acts uh, between the Blackfoot and Cree. So part of them sharing you this, um, some of you are from out west, um, but if you're not, you will hear this like, oh, the Blackfoot and Cree, they just fought all the time. Um, this is to dissuade that. We actually have a lot of relationships um, together that we have intermarriages to this day between our communities that, that, that continue. Um, so for our treaty making there, so adoption is one of these like very f um, important processes. We also had ones that people would just think are like little customs, but they're actually significantly important. So when we'd make treaty, um, what we'd do is we would, um, somebody would, from one nation would live in another person's house for four days. They would just take them in and they would do everything together and they're creating that, again, that relationship, that friendship, um, neighborliness together. Um, it'd be formalized by kiss on the lips um, between leaders. And when you think about that, it may be something that's insignificant in terms of like how it sets out, but it's this idea of vulnerability. It's like our nations, we're gonna be vulnerable together. So you can think about kissing as such an intimate act. It's creating this vulnerability between nations and saying, we have the ability to have strength and power against each other, but we're gonna be vulnerable together. So um, those are the lessons that I take from our, our treaty making stories um, and also just uh, being good neighbors. Okay, so where do we go with this? So I wanna talk about um, for the last, I'll talk for maybe 15, 10 minutes here and then we can have questions or discussion because I'm probably gonna run out of steam eventually here. Um, is I wanna think about where we're at today. So my caveat on this is I mean, we're gonna talk about the Wet'suwet'en Nation and what is going on in BC today there. Um, I'm not saying that um, uh, they share the Plains Cree legal ethics or anything like that. Um, I just want to use how we could think about, you know, the stories that you've heard today and think about the relationship between Canada and the provinces and the Wet'suwet'en Nation and how that may affect. If we're thinking about individuals as legal practitioners and what sort of ethics we create into our, our, our position with, with these events. So what's going on in Wet'suwet'en territory? Um, some of you may be well aware of this, but I'm just going to, to, to talk a little bit about it, is there is a LNG, liquid natural, uh, natural gas pipeline that has been proposed um, that's going to move through their territory. Um, it's owned by Coastal Gas Link, is the company that owns it. Uh, and since 2010, um, maybe even earlier, um, one of the clans with the Wet'suwet'en peoples, um, the Unistoten, have created, have taken up their territory in a strategic way along this route. Because what they're saying is that we have never um, given up sovereignty and title to our territory, um, and, and we do not approve of this, uh, this industrial development. Um, it's going to harm our lands. Um, it's going to cross waters that are integral to our life, etc. Numerous reasons for this as well. So um, for you legal beagles out there, uh, the Delgamook decision, um, Aboriginal title 1997, um, doesn't give title to Wet'suwet'en and Gitsan claimants. Uh, but what the court says is that they've never ceded their territory. The title um, is, it's, it's, it hasn't been ceded. Um, and then the court says, you need to come up with an agreement that settles this because it costs um, numerous 
uh, millions of dollars and days and et cetera, et cetera, in, in fighting this as well. So that was 1997. We are uh, 2020, tw 23 years. Is my math right there? Uh, 23 years later, this hasn't been resolved, right? So the court's sort of saying, we're not going to, we can't award title. We can't declare title, sorry. Um, but figure this out. We haven't figured this out. So the Unistodon is one clan of, of many, um, or it's one house affiliated with one clan of many in Wet'suwet'en territory, governed by hereditary chiefs. So when you think about, I bring up Delgamuk, um, not only for the land aspect, but because also we have had a uh, hereditary governance that's been um, governing the land um, from time immemorial as well and in Wet'suwet'en territory. And then the other fact is that they also have an Indian Act appointed and governed um, chief and council as well there as well. So there's two kind of like governance that's an issue that's ar arose today as well. Um, yeah, and so this is this is a picture of their territory. This is in, I should have done a little more background on this. This is in um, west central BC towards the coast, but not quite there, is uh, what's Sowetan territory. And so what, what has occurred there? Um, one year in the dead of winter, um, so not just like these last few days, uh, the RCMP, they moved in on um, one of the checkpoints. There's actually two checkpoints that they had at that time. Um, uh, Gitmen, which is another house, um, that is just further up the road, put a checkpoint up um, in front of the Unistoten camp. And the RCMP um, came through that and then they arrested people at um, uh, the Unistoten camp. So that was one year ago in January. And then this last year, um, we had this decision on, Christmas, on, on New Year's Eve um, from uh, the BC uh, Supreme Court here. And so the decision is, it's, there's a lot more to it that um, I'm, I'm talking in, in, in a class later this, this afternoon that I'll talk more about the law in here. But I wanted to talk about just these paragraphs um, of, of this decision from the BC Supreme Court. And so what, what the court is saying here is that um, Indigenous law, Indigenous customary laws, so the language is actually really important here and what they're using there, but won't get into it here. Um, it's not an effectual part of Canadian common law or Canadian domestic law until there is some means or process by which Indigenous customary law is recognized as being part of Canadian domestic law. And so then it kind of lists these, these areas and then it cites this case as well here. So there's, this, there's this, this aspect of it, like I don't agree with this paragraph, but I won't get into it here. Um, I think they take this case, this Alderville Nation case, and what they're doing in that case out of context, and they leave a key line out that says, like, there may be other ways that Indigenous laws are taken up um, in Canadian law, but that's not for me to decide, essentially, that decision says. Um, but it's just the, the, I like to think about this when we think about what you've learned or what we talked about with um, Plains Cree, thinking about neighborliness and treaties and that relationship. And then you can start to see what Canada, the position Canada or provinces have, have taken um, quite frequently in their sort of deeming of, of, of uh, neighborliness. As there. So within this provision, you see we have this idea of superiority. Um, Canadian law has some sort of superiority to Indigenous law, to Wet'suwet'en law here. Um, and then we see this, there's no vulnerability here, right? We see um, the, the court here, the, this one judgment is saying that we are not opening up here unless we have these things that, you know, this is not the language they use, but these things that puncture Canadian law. So an agreement, um, a declaration where evidence is made out for rights and title, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's not saying we're coming here in good faith and having an agreement to sort out these, these disagreements that should have been sorted out a long time ago as well. So um, if there's a failure of neighborliness and that's, I mean, I wrote that this morning and I was like, that's an understatement, um, <laughs> obviously. Um, <laughs> But this is the challenge here that we have. And so that's, that's the, how the courts are determining it. And you'll see legislature, um, John Horgan, pro the province of BC, uh, they have declared they, uh, they're going to implement UNDRIP 
And, and part of UNDRIP is the idea of free prior informed consent, that an indigenous nation needs to consent to developments on their traditional territories that's, that's in there. Um, so BC is the first sort of jurisdiction in Canada that said, yeah, we're going to take this up and we're going to do this work to implement UNDRIP. And, and that law, we call it FPIC, um, some of you are familiar with that specifically. But then he's also come out and said, like, the rule of law stands, so it's, it's standing behind rules like this. And then it said, I'm not even going to meet with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs because we believe that the Indian Act chiefs are uh, the governing body there as well. So we see this idea of, of uh, you know, reasonableness in court decisions and even in the legislature. But when it comes to the on the ground, living as neighbors, there's a narrowness that is occurring um, in these cases as well. So um, part of the reason I find this really narrow as well is the court is saying, uh, well, we need a declaration of Aboriginal rights and title um, within the jurisprudence. But then we also know Delgamook was like so close to making such declarations. And then we could see that the province is moving for this sort of reconciliatory relationship as well. So the judge is saying, we're going to focus on the strict law here, but we're not going to like move out beyond and say, actually, we have a responsibility to be good neighbors, to have, you know, humane treatment of Indigenous peoples, to recognize self-governance and Indigenous forms of governance, to allow the conflicts between them to play out in a more natural way. So when, in this case, we have the Indian Act, chiefs that are they're given authority, they're voted on in the communities, um, but they're held up. The hereditary chiefs have always continued to govern as well, according to what Sowetan law. And what decisions like this make, um, make happen is it, it, it uh, erodes the sort of recognition of the hereditary chiefs in it as well. So actually, when you look at this decision further, it actually does that. It says like, well, there isn't unanimity in the community, and so we're not going to, you know, we're not going to lie on what Sowetan law, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually um, a really hard de decision for advocates of indigenous laws that uh, that I am as well. Okay, so now that I've depressed us here. Um, we have to talk about what is actually happening on the ground. There is a movement on the ground, so we've had lots of protests and actions because of um, what is going on there, the position that the um, BC government has taken even here. So we have um, Indigenous nations are, are active and there's, there's protests. We had a round dance in minus 35 in Edmonton. Um, it was cold, uh, but that was occurring. Um, just yesterday, uh, people stopped the, the ferries from Victoria from going, which is a big deal in Victoria. Um, so, there's, so, so that means to say is that the courts and the legislature, they're just, it just doesn't seem like they're caught up to where, as you know, indigenous nations and even I'd say as Canadians, where we are in this. We recognize that reconciliation actually has to have a more honest form of neighborliness than, than what is actually going on. That is my position. Okay, I'm gonna get a drink of water, I ran out of water. And then I'm gonna finish with one just like really short story here. So that's, that's kind of like the nation to nation, like how, um, again, I'm not saying like, Everybody take up Plains Cree legal ethics. We have legal ethics within indigenous societies and orders as well. Um, but it provides an example or a reference on how we actually can do, we can do better, right? We can be right in our relationship. Uh, that's the title of a book that Heidi's in. Uh, <laughs> are you getting tired of me saying like in the Heidi this? Yeah. <laughs> I have to have somebody I have to pick on. So I was just like, <laughs> Heidi's here. So I get to pick on Heidi. Um, so that's a, this, 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 you know, like I'm talking some, some very like, you know, at a metaphysical level, like this conceptual level, theoretical level is probably a better way to say that. Um, but it actually has ab implications on how we individually practice law as well. Um, so I just want to share this. Um, when I was practicing law in the Yukon Territory, um, I, was, I, was doing, like, I was doing everything. I was all over the place. I was doing a little bit of civil, civil litigation. Um, and as a young lawyer, you're kind of like running off your feet and 
you're stressed out about like, am I going to do okay in court? And is the judge going to yell at me? And mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of organization that goes into it. It's, it's, there's a lot of technical aspects, obviously, to it. Um, so I was that way in my first few like litigation files. And I had one that I was pulled into that because it was actually a really major thing, a harm. It was a construction of a lady's house that didn't come through and had huge financial implications to this person. So a really important case. So doing my best as like a technical lawyer for my client, working really hard um, and, and, and like trying to fulfill my duties and, and, and get a good outcome for my client. And this person also was, was, they were First Nation, they were from a community and they shared some of their history that I can't share here. Um, but what they did is, is, this is obviously a very stressful period for them as well. And what I was neglecting was my ethics and that sort of management of like as a human to human relationship I had with this person. And I could actually feel it too. I was like, man, I'm so busy, but I'm not attending to this. And so before we had a trial and I'm going into court and like you have my trial book and I'm ready to go and you know, anticipating arguments and what's the judge gonna say. And then um, my client pulls me aside and says, I got this room, this side room. I just want us to go in there for five minutes before. And we go in there. And then what she did is she's, we go in there and she, she, ta she talked about a few things. And then she provided me tobacco. And she's like, I know in my community, this is something that we do. And I think it's something in your community you do as well. And then we sat there and we just held hands and we prayed. And that was something. And, you know, some people, again, like that idea of like praying is like, it's a significant spiritual thing for us, but also that tobacco, it provided me a, a conduit back into my sort of like legal relationship with my tradition, my family, et cetera, et cetera. And I understood what I was really doing that day. I was really trying to heal this person who had this harm, even though it was a financial sort of deal that was going on there as well. Um, and so I remember that. So I remember uh, when I talk about our legal ethics that it's not just something that I, I'm, I'm an academic now and I can talk about it in a theoretical way, but it actually has practical implications on how we live in good relations with each other today. So I think I'm out of jokes. They weren't good anyway. Um, uh, but I do thank you um, for allowing me to just talk for an hour straight here and, and for coming out. And I'm grateful for um, the territory I'm on as well to be able to bring a little bit of my legal relationships into this legal jurisdiction here. Hi, hi. Exactly. <laughs> Folks have to run off to class, and the class will move in here. Do you want to answer a few questions? Sure, yeah. Anyone brave enough to ask a question? Yeah. Or foolhardy enough. <laughs> um, I, think I found really, and thank you for your presentation, I found really interesting that this part of the decision that you quoted about the, what are loosely called indigenous customary laws, and how they get incorporated into common law systems through among other things listed as statutes. It, there was an early part in your presentation when you referred to treaties specifically as a continuous revisitation of obligations. And, and that's a foreign concept to students in this and other mm -hmm. law schools, where you're trained that the contract is the four corners of your agreement. There are things like completeness clauses that nothing outside of that clause will be permitted to interpret. Would I be wrong to think that there is in those two concepts a conflict of legal ideologies? And if I'm not wrong, what propositions would you have for bridging those gaps? Yeah, no, that, that's an astute judgment on, on the treaty law um, and how it's interpretation there. Um, it's not, I mean, the courts have said that, especially our historical treaties, they're not contracts. So it does set some room for interpretations. And then when it looks at like historical treaties, it's gonna say like there's, we're gonna give it a large liberal interpretation in favor of indigenous peoples because of the treaties, um, uh, just like the capacity of, of negotiation. It was, was one-sided at the time, et cetera, that deal. So, so there's this aspect, I wouldn't say it's renewal. Um, it, there's an aspect of interpretation that might uh, move outside of, like you're saying, the four corners of a treaty. 
um, there. Um, for modern treaties, it is. It's like the, the construction of interpretation of those is there's modern capacities for nations. And so um, there's a duty that the honor of the crown still exists, but it, they look more technically at the terms. But yeah, there is an incompatibility there. So John Burroughs would say that, um, uh, you know, if we're looking at this kind of like, he'll use the language of an originalist um, intent of these, we got to move past that in order to have these sort of right relations. And so, um, so those are the, yeah, we're talking about those foundational, how we're going to interpret these. But then when we look back at what is the common intention of treaty parties, especially for Treaty 7 or Treaty 6, um, it was the intention that we had these processes of renewal, that there was going to be a continued um, uh, interpretation, a relationship that it continued, like is, uh, for better or worse, like seasonal, like there's going to be some sort of way that we can come back and have like a living treaty process. But yes, that hasn't been the case that the uh, Canada hasn't taken that position at all. So we're, um, we're part of a research unit that was talking about, it was working with the federal government on um, treaties. And it was, I can't remember exactly what the number was, but it was like the, the amount of funding it gave towards treaty relationships um, was, it was, I think it was 95 or 98% of the funding went towards creating treaties in BC and the historical treaties, it was like 2%, right? So literally, yeah, they're taking this position that the treaty question has been settled over these nations that we, they contend is ceded land, and, and that's that, yeah. That doesn't really answer the question, that just kind of explains it more, right? Yeah. yeah. I was struck by the whole thing of the relationships, particularly about the, the extended family and how that you know, carried on. Um, that was the way it was when I was a child as well. Yeah. However, what happened, I noticed, as I was becoming a young person and working in social work and in the community, was that you'd have families coming to Toronto, for example, and they would naturally want to come and stay with their relatives, but then the landlord who was renting the flat would say, well, there's extra people, so I want extra money. And the income, of course, was not necessarily expanded by these people coming, because they may be coming because they're leaving a violent situation, they mm -hmm. may be coming because they're looking for work or school or, or just coming to explore for a bit. So it occurred to me that um, we've been nuclearized because of the outside customs and the laws. And I'm thinking to myself, so much of the healing that we need is in indigenous people is to get back to those values because those work. Mm -hmm. And they create meaning and belonging. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people that amongst us do not have that sense mm -hmm. because of what's happened to them. So I think it's really important that this not only be in the legal group of people, but it needs to come out for you know, us, everybody in our mm -hmm. communities, and to hear these stories. Because unless you grew up with a family who's had that continuity, mm -hmm. continuity, um, you're lost. And you know, and nature pours a vacuum, and whatever's there outside, the stereotypes, for instance, become part of that person's identity as opposed to the real stories. Mm -hmm. So, I guess what I'm saying, thinking about is, how do we get those things out more? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for sharing that. And that's my experience as well. Like I grew up with like my cousins around me and every and then and part of it and this is just for my family, part of it is like um there's we you know, we had a lot of um uh alcohol abuse in our family and that sort of thing. So part of it when you have that sort of autonomy of being like the one who governs that like your home then you start to be like, oh, well, I don't, you know, like you can't, you're unhealthy at this point, you can't come in. And I found that's been a pretty isolating thing as well. So finding that balance and then, and finding the way they are. Once our communities um, regain health in that way, like I like that story that we have of the, the person going and find that health, then we can actually start to reclaim that. It'll be easier as individuals just to step up and say like, yeah, this house is, you can stay here, right? Because we do have this like modern 
financial slash all these other uh, challenges. But um, the second part of that, well, Godwin is actually like, so it's actually becoming something in Alberta, the prairies area, that's we're talking about it quite a bit more. And so what you're asking for of like, we need to understand this and more, it's actually be becoming pretty well known and we're starting to see like this general reclamation of what that means as well, which will, will aid, but yeah, for sure, lots of work to do. have a positive implication for all the kids that are coming into care, which are in greater in numbers than when we were in the residential school. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna be apologizing again in 20 years. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly, thank you. Carry. What do you think the court should have done in the coastal ga gasoline case? Oh, jeez. And how do you think the court? <laughs> oh, jeez. I was saving this for your class, but <laughs> um, that's a great question. I do think that one. I think they misinterpret Alderville, um, as I mentioned. I think like they uh, make no room for. So they take uh, Justice Manaman's decision there where he says, he does this, this whole kind of canvassing of like where indigenous laws have been taken up by the courts and through and how. And essentially says at the end, like this is his wording, but they leave out one paragraph where he says, and there may be other ways, but it's not the question that's before me to decide this as well. So it's, he's not saying like, this is it, right? Um, also, it, it ignores decisions like Connolly and Woolrich, which is like the adoption of Cree law without, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't section 35 or those things as well. So it just seems the court can just say, Indigenous laws were in effect in this territory, and we're making that thing. So I think there's there might be an error there as well. Um, but the other one, I guess it's it's more I guess of an opinion of mine that the rest of the decision they are just dismissive of like is, there's not enough evidence of Wet'suwet'en law. Um, there is, which might be what was brought before them. The question of that. Um, that it's just going to be a point of view, those sorts of things. Um, if the language was, we've made this decision, we've, we've actually really accounted for um, where we're at with the landscape of Indigenous law in Canada today, but we're still making this on this balance of probabilities that they use in this, then that might have been a little more satisfactory to me. But it was just, it was kind of like, it just felt like they're using, they saw what Sowetan law as a barrier that they needed just to like diminish in, in this case as well. So um, so we have, so to answer your question, probably not as satisfactory. Um, one, I feel like this is a misconstrued of that case there. And secondly, um, the kind of like language around indigenous laws and where they are today, the court really takes a very narrow view of that, that um, essentially is really harmful, quite honestly, to, to what's so in law. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> well, I want a follow-up question. <laughs> yes. Looked at from the standpoint of Canadian law, should Canadian law regard Wet'suwet'en law or Plains Cree law as domestic law of which judges can take judicial notice or as foreign law that would ordinarily have to be proved by expert evidence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, oh. <laughs> This is, an, this is an ex prosecutor. <laughs> These are great questions. Um, my, you know, I was having a conversation with a student yesterday about this, and, and we're on camera. Oh no, people are going to hear me this. I think our nations, the idea of governance is it's, we have different um, positions in different nations. Um, but I think if like Canada was to say, okay, we're giving self governance today, like how are you going to go about this? is we're gonna, they're gonna be forced to that question, right? Are we gonna say we're a international nation um, and try to treat, create that relationship there? Or do we want a de domestic dependent relationship? Some of what we see in states. Um, and quite honestly, I think just like the ability of like Plains Cree nations, it might be this idea of like, we are gonna attach ourselves to the treaty relationship and which would ultimately probably mean that it'd be a domestic, relationship within Canadian law and setting out some sort of self-governance that is internal there, but more like treaty to treaty, nation to nation. So um, not more, I guess, along the lines of like a sui generis relationship that is treaty six. And that's kind of the way our, our communities 
are positioning themselves right now and talking like that. But I couldn't say that for the Wet'suwet'en. The Wet'suwet'en are probably just going to say, we're an international nation and we've never ceded territory and this is the way we're going about it as well. Or I wouldn't say that for the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee would say, we're an international nation, et cetera, right? So, um, so a little bit all over the board there as well. Yeah. Any more? No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're complicated. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Let's thank Darcy again. Thank you.